Thank you, Jim, and thank you for that nice introduction. It's wonderful to be here. Nothing uh, closer to my heart than social networks and health. So I'm delighted to see so many people actively engaged in it. And it, you know, it occurs to me that I ought to take a minute to just talk about my trajectory into networks. I, I got into networks out of kind of stupidity. I wasn't trained in social sciences. My bachelor's degree is in math. Then I discovered diffusion of innovations and I thought of diffusion as a network process because I didn't think about it as a regression model or anything like that. So I came into it sort of uh, uh, accidentally, if you will, and have enjoyed uh, watching this field grow uh, really terrifically uh, lately. So um, thank you. and I'm. So excited to share some of the work that I've done with you all and, um, and uh, hopefully give you some food for thought because you've been saturated with all kinds of material, technical things uh, for, for a week and you've crammed about six months of work into five days. So good luck digesting it all. Hopefully this will be a little bit more relaxing. Yeah, pun intended, right? You're having lunch and you're digesting all this network stuff. Um, but hopefully this will be a little bit more substantive and a little bit easier to swallow, if you will. So I'm going to talk a little bit about diffusion of innovations. As uh, Jim mentioned, uh, Ev Rogers is really well known in this field. He was in fact my advisor and somebody that turned me on to the neat ways that you can think about network models of diffusion of innovations. And then I'm going to talk about two different things. One, network models for diffusion, sort of how network models of change, how networks influence change. And then I'm going to segue into network interventions or network models for change. Uh, because I, I personally think that's where there's a lot of exciting opportunity and action these days, both at a theoretical and practical applied level. So I don't need to go through these first couple of slides. Usually you have to convince people that networks exist and that there are all kinds of different networks. You know that. You've been looking at these different kinds of things, things that have been going on for the past uh, you know, couple hundred years. Uh, they're really important for things like flu and disease spread and whatnot. Um, and, and my own particular interest in the past, uh, I'd say the past two decades, has been focusing somewhat on the role of networks in adolescent health. And I've collected a lot of data among uh, uh, students in middle school and high school and so on. Here's, I have hundreds of these kinds of network diagrams here where you can see there's 12-year-olds. These are friendships in one classroom. <laughs> Clearly, you can see there's two different groups. You all now know what constitutes the attribute that defines those groups, right? Girls and boys. They want nothing to do with one another, right? And in fact, when I had a 12-year-old girl, I was delighted to see this diagram. <laughs> this was great. I didn't have to worry about condoms, prophylactics, anything, right? The other thing that you'll find too, whenever there are any bridges from girls to boys, it's typically the girls that are willing to admit that they're friends with a boy, but a boy will never admit being friends with a girl. And my son would never admit to being friends with his daughter, with my daughter, so you know, it's just the way it goes. And then of course, you've learned now that we can extract centrality measures from these networks, we can look at different um, clique analysis and subgroups, what it means to be on the periphery, what it means to be on the center, what it means to be a bridging node or a bridging link and so on and whatnot. And this is all fine and well, but then of course kids get to high school and this is what happens, right? So now I'm worried about condoms and all the other things that you have to worry about when boys and girls start to mix with one another. And it really is interesting the way they transition so much in terms of their relationships from 12 years old to 14 to 16. It's a pretty critical time in development. Now of course, although I've put a couple of network measures out there in the field, I've also been primarily interested in how networks influence behavior. I'm kind of an applied person at heart. And so studying networks alone is very interesting, and I hope you appreciate that. Um, but also how they influence behavior is also important. And, I, and it moves us from theories about networks, which I think ergums tell us a lot about, to rather network theory, which is how networks influence processes that happen on or because of networks. And the main theory that we have used to inform this activity is diffusion of innovations, right? It's been around for a long time. First diffusion book came out in the early 1900s on, uh, on social limitation. Um, and then the paradigmatic study by Ryan and Gross in 1943. I have a whole long lecture on the evolution of uh, diffusion theory as a, as a social, sociology of science kind of process. But the key thing about diffusion is that it happens through interpersonal contact. 
And I say there are a lot of diffusion studies out there that actually are not, in fact, diffusion studies because they don't study how ideas spread from person to person through interpersonal contact. So the key insight is that adoption of a new idea occurs through interpersonal communication, persuasion, modeling, and all kinds of different processes. And the thing that gets really sexy about diffusion is you have this really neat growth curve, right? And you see this, you learn this in business school one-on-one. -on -one. You say a new product's coming in here, a couple people try it early. You hope to get takeoff, you hit that hockey stick, it grows, you go from the lag phase to the log phase, your new product takes off, you're super wealthy, you're rich and famous and all that stuff, right? And you can look at lots of diffusion processes that mimic this kind of S-shaped growth curve and you get an incidence curve or new adopters that sometimes approximates a little bit like a normal distribution. Now I did my first degree in math and so I spent the first, uh, you know, the second year actually in my PhD program working on mathematical models to estimate the growth rates in these diffusion curves and creating the, you know, an adaptation of the Bass model where you have a coefficient for external influence and internal influence. What part of the diffusion process is driven by external communications? Which part is driven by person-to-person -person contact? Spent a lot of time doing this, estimated these models on a bunch of existing empirical diffusion curves, came with, with some model parameters, and then I decided, guess what? This is boring as hell, right? Who cares about this? What's really interesting is the processes that occur amongst people in the network, right? So I opened up an Excel spreadsheet, I created a hypothetical community of 100 people, and I decided that 5% of them are going to adopt a new behavior by some kind of external communications, or they're the first ones to get sick because they traveled and spent time in a hospital or whatnot. And those five interact with the 95 non-adopters. This is a very simple, susceptible, infected model that you've already heard about this week. There's a transmission rate of 1%. You get 4.75 newly people infected. Now you have a new pool of 9.75 adopters or newly infected people. <clears throat> that starts the next cycle. They interact, convert more, and so on. And it turns out when you do this, you get this beautiful S-shaped curve, right? I mean, you could put a bow on this, give it to a, an epidemiologist as a gift, and they would be happy. <laughs> this looks terrific, right? And you know what? This is wrong. And why is this wrong? I know you all know why this is wrong. What are you doing here this week? Studying? Networks, right? There's no network in this. We're assuming random interaction between the uninfected and the susceptible, or the infected and the susceptible. Once you put the network in there, once you start to see that there's clustering in the network, right? Then that process starts to take place in a much different way. And in fact, years ago, I took some empirical networks and I took you know, generated random networks of the same size and density, simulated diffusion through them, and you get this nice S-shaped curve, right? But when you do it on empirical networks, you get bumps and troughs in the diffusion process because it's going to take off when it's within a cluster, and then it's going to slow down when it gets trapped within the cluster and has to resort to finding bridges that go between the clusters, right? And so the clustering in networks, the structure in networks, is what gives diffusion processes interest and it causes them to deviate from that standard simple growth curve model. Okay, so now how do we think about the way the networks are going to influence behavior change, social networks of behavior change? And there are a lot of models out there, but I'm going to focus on the one that I think is the most useful and something that I call really a sort of, uh, uh, you know, a generative engine for understanding how networks influence behavior, and that's the simple exposure model, right? When you're exposed to other people's behaviors, you're more likely to adopt and accept that behavior. And there's a lot of mechanisms that might drive this, right? Information, social support, um, uh, uh, modeling, peer pressure, and so on. But nonetheless, we tend to believe that as your network fills with users, you're more likely to become a user yourself, right? As your friends smoke, you're more likely to smoke. As your friends drink, you're more likely to drink. They buy an iPhone, you buy an iPhone, you name it, right? So there's this exposure process that goes on. And I want to 
deviate now from this a little bit and take the stylized version of a network with six octors and say, well, yes, exposure is associated with adoption. If this person ego here is connected to four, six others and four of them are users, they're more likely to become a user. But we also know from evidence that perceived use is also associated with adoption. So we've analyzed data, sociometric data, and shown that ego may misperceive what F and C are doing. And in fact, they're often incorrect about those perceptions, but it doesn't matter. It's those perceptions that are going to drive their behavior. So if I perceive everybody else is doing it, I'm more likely to do it whether they in fact are doing it or not. And we've got at least three studies that have demonstrated that empirically. Samalian ties also affect influence, right? So in fact, if A and B are connected to one another, they have a stronger influence on ego than, a, or than F or C who are not connected to others in ego's environment. So that social environment matters a lot in terms of the amount of influence that alters can exert on egos. And in fact, the whole network environment here makes a difference, right? So if all of my friends are friends with each other, their behaviors are more likely to influence me than if my friends are not friends with one another, right? Because their decisions and behaviors and communications are all reinforcing to one another rather than being um, disparate and different and, and so on. Tie strength is also associated with influence, right? It turns out that Stronger ties exert a stronger influence on ego than weaker ties. And that makes a lot of sense, right? People that you're strongly connected to, closely connected to, have a strong bond with, are more likely to influence you than other people, right? So if I'm going to do something really important, I'm going to turn to my spouse, my, if I have adult children or my parents, people, my best friends, the people that I've been with a long time, they're going to have more influence on my behaviors than those that I see less frequently, have a less emotional or sentimental uh, 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 relationship with. And in fact, we know this strength of weak ties article is so famous and so important. And what most people forget is that weak ties are actually really, really strong when it comes to information, right? New ideas uh, about something. But when it comes to behavior, it's the stronger ties that make a difference. And I believe and make the point that the more consequential the behavior, the more tie strength is going to matter when it comes to having their influences on you. If I'm going to spend a lot of money to buy something new, I'm really really going to turn to my close ties for assurance that I can do that rather than, um, rather than weak ties. Now there's some evidence that indirect exposures may matter and this is a little bit controversial and I think this is an area where there's research waiting to be done. Christakis and Fowler argued that influence went out three steps. Sometimes I've seen it go out two steps in some of the analyses I've done. I really don't know, and it probably varies a lot by network type, by behavioral type, and so on, and whether or not the intermediary alters need to be adopters of the behavior in order for that influence to be conveyed is an open research question. So I think you know, we, we, we probably need some studies of really good quality data to make any statements about the role of indirect influences and how far out they go. The key insight by Ron Burt in 1987 is that structural equivalence can matter, right? So I may be influenced by others in the network that I'm not connected to, but occupy the same position I occupy in the network, right? So here, ego and D are connected to the same people. They're not connected to one another, but because they're connected to the same people or in the same position, they tend to monitor each other's behavior. So for example, this can happen a lot with firms, right? Firms are in competitive positions. They occupy the same place in the supply chain or competing for the same markets. So they are influencing one another, right? Once McDonald's started to give out cheap Happy Meals, Burger King needed to give out hats and Happy Meals and so on, right? So that kind of behavioral influence happens. Now we can see in some cases and for some behaviors for people that competition will be there or it might not, right? So in a friendship context in schools, sometimes the friends may be competing for the attention of uh, members of the opposite sex, or they may be in friendship positions and influence one another through direct communication. So I think contrasting 
peer influences through direct ties, so-called cohesive influences, versus peer influences through structural equivalence is an interesting way to test different mechanisms of social change and social influence. More interestingly, what Ron Burt proposed is that you could actually expand and contract the radius of social influence you wanted to consider in social network influences. So for example, I can raise or lower the, um, the, the power of the structural equivalence matrix so that I can really weight very strongly the, the, the influence of structural equivalent alters. Or I can relax that and allow, well, not only am I influenced by Jim, who occupies a structural equivalence, but also by Dana and a couple of other people in the network. So I can expand or contract that radius of social influence. And so I do that through structural equivalence by exponentiating the social structural equivalence matrix, or I do it through the cohesion by expanding the, the weight of indirect ties and so on. So this combination of looking at not only structural equivalence, but cohesive influences, expanding and contracting the radius of social influence gives you a lot of different alternatives when it comes to testing theoretical mechanisms of social influence. We can also do other interesting things, right? We have network data, so we know the centrality scores or other kinds of network metrics that we calculate on individuals in a network, so we can actually <coughs> weight our influences by those metrics. And in a high school context, for example, you might think that somebody who's very popular would have a stronger influence on ego than someone who's not. And in fact, that may be a marker for certain personality characteristics that are also associated with being influential and having a strong effect on others. And so here, this is in degree centrality, right? How many centrality measures do we have in the network field? Take a guess. Three. Too many, <laughs> yeah. right? We have the big three, degree closeness and betweenness. But we, are at, at latest count, are up to over 100 different algorithms for measuring centrality in social networks. So there's a lot of choices out there that all may have different kinds of theoretical mechanisms uh, under, undergirding them. What about joint participation in events, right? If it, we've, and we've shown this with our data, that if you're teammates with somebody and a friend, you're, they're going to have a stronger influence on your behavior than if you're just friends or teammates alone. And you can think about all different kinds of events, right? Sporting events, clubs, cultural identities, all of those things are likely to also contribute to the kind of influence that a person can have on one another. If we share a lot of activities, go to a lot of the same conferences, we're more likely to have an influence on one another in a professional domain. What about the attributes of the alters, right? We think, we've thought for a long time in diffusion theory, that homophily is associated with greater social influence. So if we're similar on a lot of demographic or other kinds of characteristics, the flow of information and communication between us is likely to be more, uh, more it'd be easier and, and more frequent. And so as a consequence, it could be that ego is more likely to be influenced by uh, his male friends rather than his female friends. And there may be some behaviors that are actually attribute specific, and so it's only likely that that influence would occur when people are similar on the attribute, right? So, so that's important to consider. And of course now we've created online networks, so that's blown up everything that used to happen in the world, right? Now we have to worry about Instagram and Snapchat and Facebook. Not Facebook so much anymore, it turns out, right? Um, and then the, uh, the thing that I discovered, actually what I sort of discovered in my dissertation was this notion of network thresholds, right? So it turns out that some people are willing to adopt a new behavior when a minority or none of their network partners are willing to. Other people wait until their network is filled with users before they're willing to try something, right? I'm a high threshold adopter. Why am I a high threshold adopter? Because I'm smart. Why? Because I'm going to wait until everybody else has one so that when I need to find out how to use it, I can just say, how do I do this? How do I do that? Right? So I wait. I wait. Other people, they're really eager to adopt things early. Right? And these low threshold adopters are actually a bizarre kind of human being. <laughs> because they do something I would never, ever, ever do. You know what they do? 
they read the instructions or the manual when they buy something, right? They open it up, they, open, they find out what are the new features that it has, how do you do it, and then they take joy and, joy and pride in communicating to their networks, this is how you do it, this is really cool, you know? And they'll camp outside of Best Buy for two weeks, you know, waiting to buy this new gadget. So these low threshold people are a different class of individual, and the high threshold people remember the smart ones. Keep that in mind. <laughs> and then this is just a graph of what, so, you know, traditionally in diffusion, we classified people as early or late adopters, right? That was a key characteristic if you're early versus late. And with the threshold concept, we also now bring in the network position. You're either early in your network or late in your network. And once you do that, you can discover that there are people late in the diffusion process that are only late because their position in the network gives them access to the behavior or the information very late in the process. <coughs> if they happen to be connected to somebody over here, they would have been an earlier adopter, right? And then you also get people here, 11, 57, and 20, you think of them as being early adopters, but in fact, they're late in their network. They're waiting until all their friends do it before they're willing to do it. So it gives you a micro level view of this macro level diffusion process. So having said that, now one of the problems that we have is there are a lot of different ways to weight these social network influences. And we've been estimating in our models, in our ergon models, in our Sienna models, and in our autocorrelation models, very simply, right, direct influence of your direct ties. But we're not considering all these other mechanisms that may very well be driving behavior and social processes on networks. And, um, and so the minute you don't see a cohesive direct influence of behavior, Full stop, we stop, but wait a second. There's a lot of other mechanisms that may be going on that may be driving things, so um, it's a challenge for us. And it's a challenge to know, did we test everything? Have we properly specified our model? And I very much appreciate with our development of Ergum and Sienna models that it's supposed to be very theoretical about what the micro-level processes are that are driving the structure of the network. And what I will argue is those micro-level processes need to be considered within the context of theoretical models for behavior change and for diffusion. So I want to pause just for a second to do a little advertising. So um, when I did my dissertation, I was actually interested in doing network models of diffusion of innovations. Now, diffusion takes a long time. I didn't want to be in graduate school forever, right? None of us do. <laughs> I'm sure some of you are chomping at the bit now. Um, so I went and tried to get find existing data. And it turns out the medical innovation data, which Jim mentioned the other day, was available. And so I, um, I contacted uh, Ron Burt, who had gotten an NSF grant to recreate these data and put it on diskette. And he sent me a diskette with the data and said, here, it's yours. You now have the data. Nobody's ever writing me again. I'm sending them to you. Wow, great, OK. <laughs> And then the Korean family planning data were collected back in the late, uh, early 1970s by uh, colleagues at the, the Seoul School of Public Health in Korea. Those data were in the hands of Mark Granovetter. I wrote Mark Granovetter. He sent me a gigantic tape, you know, which I mounted and turned into a data set. And then I got the Brazilian farmers data set. So I was able to capture these three classic diffusion network studies. And it's on those that I started to develop a lot of these social influence models and these ideas. And as a consequence, in the past year and a half, we've been developing something called Net Diffuser, which is an R library for estimating network diffusion models. And we've got built into it, of course, right? Um, where, did, where did that slide go? Um, all of these things can be done with one command. Exposure, toggle, indirect, or direct off. Exposure, weighted by centrality, pick a centrality measure. All of these different kinds of things can now be done in one line of R code rather than the 80 lines of Gauss code that I used to write to do anything. For those of you who even heard of Gauss, that's how long ago it was. So net diffuser is really, really cool. We've got graphing, so you can, you know, if you've got the diffusion process, it'll automatically draw network diagrams like this. The new adopters are red, the continuing adopters are blue. You can watch the diffusion process occur. 
um, over time. It automatically calculates and graphs thresholds for you because that's my favorite measure in the whole wide world, right? So I want to make sure that's easy for everybody to do. Um, you can run, uh, so this is the Brazilian farmers data, all of the time periods in the diffusion process. It's 11 different villages, 700 people. So it's, you know, you don't see much in the large graph like this, but you can do uh, this kind of thing. We also calculate infectiousness and susceptibility, right? So infectiousness is the extent to which people who are connected to you adopt in the immediate time period after. Susceptibility is the extent to which you adopt immediately after the people that you're connected to adopt, right? And the threshold concept actually is susceptibility across the whole prior time frame. Um, and then, you know, you can obviously toggle the direction of these arrows around and expand or contract the window of influence that you're interested in. If you want it to be two months or three months or four months, that's easy to change. So these measures are built uh, right into, uh, into the library. So that's just an advertisement for Net Diffuser. We started doing workshops on it at the Sunbelt Conference. Um, if you're interested in learning more about it, we're happy to send you links to, I, I should mention that George Vega Jan is the one that's done all the programming, because I am a horrible programmer. So uh, it's good to have somebody that knows what they're doing. So I've been doing diffusion research for a long time. I guess I probably started around 89, and, and by the you know, 2010, 2011, of course, I had gotten frustrated with the data that I had, right? All of this, the prior diffusion research typically had inexact measures of time of adoption, often based on recall, although not exclusively. And the networks were often measured at one time, so the networks were static, they weren't dynamic. You had response rates that varied across, you know, across studies and across communities, and of course, missing data, and they were all old, right? All these things, these classic diffusion data sets are, are from long time ago. Um, so fortunately, I was able to discover an opportunity to get some really great data. And these are data on country ratification of the Framework Convention for Tobacco Control. This is the first public health treaty that's been introduced by the World Health Organization. It's introduced in 2003. And by 2012, 90% of all countries had ratified the Framework Convention for Tobacco Control. So we know exactly when countries ratified the treaty. And because we're talking about countries, we have 191 countries, we've got no missing data, right? Countries don't disappear. They don't refuse to be in the globe, they're right there. You see? <laughs> Some of them have split in half, which is a little interesting, but, but otherwise, all the countries are there, they're all present and accounted for. So we did a study to look at treaty ratification, and it would depend on country attributes, right? how much tobacco they produce, their tobacco um, uh, production, income, population, government processes, civil society, all that stuff. And then we had a bunch of networks that we were going to look at. Distance, which is fixed, again, countries. Um, but we could look at trade, which varied over time, tobacco-specific trade, which varies over time. And then we had this thing called Global Link. And Global Link was an online communication system for tobacco control advocates to share information with one another. And there were um, over 7,000 people that were members of Global Link. It started in 1992 and continued until 2012 and was very active. So we were able to extract three networks from the Global Link data. Referrals, if you're gonna join Global Link, somebody had to refer you to be able to vouch that you were a tobacco control advocate and not an industry representative. Posts to the Global Link um, uh, forums and then co-subscriptions. That is, uh, there were 45 different news services and individuals could subscribe to different news services so we constructed a two-mode network that countries were connected if they had control, tobacco control advocates that subscribed to the same new services. So then we run a diffusion network model. And diffusion network models convert the data to event history analysis. So my N is now 754. I've got time dummies for all the time periods to control for time trend. And you can see that diffusion and adoption of the FCTC occurred very rapidly in the beginning, right? In the early time periods, countries ratified very quickly, and then it tapered off. And when we looked at all of our different network effects, the one thing that we found was a strong 
effect of co-subscriptions. That is, when countries that I am connected to via subscribing to the same services ratified, I was more, as a country, was more likely to ratify in the subsequent year. Right? So that exposure effect was strong and worked well. Now, we tried to control for a lot of things like language, which may account for that, or even colonial ties that may account for that, and none of it explained it. There was something about the co-subscriptions that had an effect there. So that was interesting. When I put the proposal together to do this study, I did a lot of thinking, which isn't something we get a chance to do very much in this business, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, we're always running around writing letters and dealing with all of the crises that occur in a department. Um, one of the things that I started to do was think about the diffusion process. And the thing that's significant, the sine qua non, if I can do Latin for a minute, not that I speak Latin, of diffusion is the fact that it occurs over time. It's a time process. And I thought about, well, what happens over time during diffusion? Well, there's a couple of different effects we've been concerned about. One is external influence, right? That is media advertisements or travel to another community or something like that. And it seems to me that the effect of external influence on diffusion behavior is going to decrease over time. Right? In the beginning, nobody in the community is doing anything, so the only place I can get information is from an advertisement or some external media. But over time, that's going to go down as important because as more people adopt, I'm not so worried about that. The other process that we have in network effects is selection, right? Now selection to me also would be very high in the beginning of, a, in, of the diffusion process. Why? Because in the beginning, I have nobody in my network that does something, right? If I'm the second kid in a junior high school to start smoking, there's only one other smoker. And so I'm going to select to go smoke with that person. But again, over time, as the community fills with adopters, I don't need to make network changes in order to have people in my network be consistent with my behavior. I'm going to have a smoker in my network, right? On the other hand, influence should increase over time. As the behavior becomes normative, as there are more adopters, I'm more likely to say, hey, this is, this is taking off. Everybody's doing this. I better get an iPhone. I don't care how high my threshold is. I need one of these, right? And then the last process that I think is one of the most important is the role of opinion leaders. And here, this is varied. We know from past research that opinion leaders are early adopters when the behavior is normative and compatible with the community. However, when the behavior is not compatible, not culturally compatible, opinion leaders delay their adoption. So I think the shape of this opinion leadership influence is going to vary depending on the setting, depending on the behavior, and so on. And you'll notice that I've just left effect size up here. So I'm not making any statement about how big these effect sizes are. I'm just thinking conceptually about what happens with them over time. So I specified this theoretical model in the grant proposal. We got the data. And I ran statistical tests to see if it worked. Now, I was really tempted to turn both of these into less than 0.05. I have to be honest with you, right? <laughs> but you know, it's, it's close enough. It's trending in the right direction. They're probably in perfect measures for the processes that I was interested in. But these do reflect consistency with that theoretical model. And I have to tell you, as somebody who is a data grunt and analyzes data for the sake of analyzing data, to actually specify something theoretically in advance, get a grant, get the data, do it and find it true, is just shocking to me. Because the last thing I ever <laughs> expected is for my theory to be correct. Right, because most of the time when we analyze data, the data just abuse the theory. So. All right, so that's, and I hope that that's been interesting enough to think about the different ways that networks influence behaviors, networks um, of behavior change. Years ago, of course, you know, you're running around pitching network analysis to organizations and trying to get consulting money and stuff like that. And the first question they ask, of course, is, well, if networks are so important, how can we use them to make things better, right? What can we do to use network data to design and implement better interventions? <laughs>
And it occurred to me, oh, really only in the last couple of years, that many of our public health interventions are in fact network interventions. We just don't conceive of them that way, right? But we're oftentimes trying to get people to go seek healthcare providers, to talk to their friends about different kinds of uh, behaviors, to get social support, um, to tr fragment transmission networks, and so on and so forth. So that the general idea of networks as part of health interventions is not strange. But being explicit about it is rather new. So a couple of years ago, we published this paper, Social Network Analysis for Program Implementation. And in it, we borrowed the stages of implementation that we usually use. There's a number of these stages out there, but any, any implementation process has these exploration or needs assessment stage, program design stage, implementation stage, and sustainment and monitoring. So we use the stage model to structure the ways we think about using network data for interventions. And the first is network data for needs assessment and exploration. And it really prompts you to ask a bunch of questions. Is there a network out there to work with, right? Um, what is the network position of those that are defining the problem? Are there disconnected subgroups in the community? Are there isolates who need to be um, uh, brought in, right? So when you think about the community as a network, you immediately think, well, are these the people that are defining what the problem is and helping us to design the intervention? But that also means, of course, that we've got isolates out here that are not going to be reached by the intervention. And we've got a dyad down, a tri a dyad down here that's not going to be reached. And we've got this subgroup over here, which is actually probably the ones that's causing all the problems, right? If you look at a classroom, you're going to find that there's a bunch of kids that are always screwing around, connected to each other over here. They have nothing to do with the rest of the network, but that's precisely where the problem behaviors are. So, so often, without understanding the network, we're not creating problems that reach those people who are in need, or designing them in ways that will reach them. So, and then just some text, right? Community is network, and I don't have to sell that on you. You all are network analysts, so you already believe that to be true. The other action is in program design, what we call adoption. And so here we want to consider what kinds of network things do we need to consider when designing a program. And a couple of years ago I published this paper on network interventions, which really makes the case that we can use network data to design more effective interventions. Right? There are purposeful efforts to use social networks or network data to generate better influence, accelerate behavior change, improve performance achieve desirable outcomes among individuals, communities, organizations, or populations. Could I be any more general than that? If so, please let me know how. <laughs> and the key contribution of this paper is this table right here, this taxonomy of network interventions. And the easiest way to think about this table is reading across the top row where we have a strategy of identification. We're going to identify some people in the network that are going to do something for us, either be change agents or design the program or whatnot. And the typical way we've thought about that, of course, is by identifying opinion leaders, right? And that's naturally intuitive. And when you go into a company and you say, I'm going to identify the opinion leaders in this company so you can bring about improved changes, the boss always goes, that's great. I can't wait to find out what a great leader I am. And of course, they never are, but that's not what you tell them in the beginning. Now, as you know, to find opinion leaders, you want to find those that are highest in centrality in the network, right? But of course, what did we say earlier? We've got 100 different algorithms for defining the central nodes. But nonetheless, that gives us different choices at the operational level. So when thinking about designing interventions, we have strategic choices, tactical choices, and operational choices. The opinion leader intervention is the one that we have done the most. Right? It's the most typical network intervention. It's easy to measure. It's intuitively appealing. It's got proven effectiveness. We wrote a paper in 2007 that identified over 20 different studies that use network data to identify opinion leaders and had them be change agents and create a statistically significant improvement in outcomes uh, over the control condition. The shocking thing about this paper is we started by saying, well, I'm going to find out how they define opinion leaders, gatekeepers, and whatnot in the public health literature. We'll find out that they never use network data to do it, and we'll propose, and I already had the discussion section written before I'd analyzed the data, which is always a mistake. <laughs> um, so 
I thought, well, and then we'll just say, look, if we use network data, because I knew there were a couple network studies out there, we'd be way more effective. By the time we finished the literature review, we find over 20 studies that had done this. I was like, holy cow, everybody's reinventing the wheel, right? And why are they doing that? Because, and you all are public health researchers or medical researchers, because the literature is organized the way NIH is organized, which is completely wrong, right? It's organized by organ and disease and not by methodology or goal. Right? So you find a study that treats digestive and kidney diseases, and you find a study that treats heart disease, and you find a study that treats vaginal birth after first C-section. I don't know what institute that falls under. Probably an HLBI. Right? So, but there are all these different studies in these different realms, and none of them referenced each other. So they're all out there. There's this gigantic body of literature. And then in 2011, the Cochrane Review, which really knows how to do a review, right? It's not like I do. They do this great review, identify 18 trials, find all of them use network data to identify peer opinion leaders, and they find that they're more effective than no intervention, one intervention, two interventions, other, bless you, other interventions. And in fact, they get a 12% absolute increase in compliance by identifying opinion leaders. That's a huge effect. I don't know how many of you do program evaluation, but like if we get two people changing their behavior like in a contraceptive promotion program, we're jumping out of our skin going, we're gods, right? This is huge. And let me tell you, it is the dumbest possible thing you could do with network data. It is, right? It's literally the dumbest thing you can do. I send out a survey, I count up how many nominations people receive, and I recruit them. You know from your work, there's a lot of other more interesting stuff you can do with network data. Um, so, I'm, again, I do a whole workshop on network interventions. You guys are just workshopped out. I know that already, so forget that. This slide is just a demonstration of all these different <coughs> kinds of tactical choices that you have. And the take home message is there's a lot of choices out there when it comes to thinking about network interventions. So, do you know, the in-degree opinion leader model if you want. You'll be successful, but there's a lot of other things you can do too. And there are other things, you know, that I haven't even identified. So, um, uh, uh, you know, there's lots of development in this field. The question, of course, then comes, well, if I have all these choices, how do I select a network intervention, right? And, of course, that's going to depend probably somewhat on what kind of networks you have and what the existing network structure is, right? If there's no network there, then I've got to build the network before I can do anything. And it may depend on the behavioral characteristics, right? Is this something that's already being, you know, used in a, in a lot of places? Is it, is it culturally compatible? Is it cost effective? Are there, are there characteristics, attributes of the innovation that I need to worry about? But more interesting and completely, completely un, uh, encumbered by data we can think about the theoretical mechanisms that are driving the behavior in the community. And the existence of that particular mechanism may give us a choice for what kind of network intervention strategy or tactic to use. And quite simply, I just made up this table, okay? But I think it's reasonable. If power is what's driving behavior, leaders are important to identify, right? But if your mechanism is conflict, you're probably going to have subgroups in the community, and you're going to have to identify bridges that work across those subgroups, right? If you've got a merger and acquisition, the, the two different sides don't talk, you need to find bridges to bring them together. If cohesion is driving the behavior, you can use key players. If isolation is a problem, right? We know from a lot of mental health research that adolescents at risk for suicide ideation and attempts and so on are generally those that are on the periphery of the network. Well, now we need to find people that are peripheral in the network. Well, what about thresholds? If we can identify low threshold adopters early, let's recruit them because they're used to adopting before anybody else does. Group identification groups and so on and so forth. So, so there's a suggestion there. If you know what's driving the behavior of the community, it has some suggestion on what kind of mechanism, uh, what kind of uh, 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 network intervention you might want to try to do. Now, I will tell you that this bottom section tactic down here when we talk about um, alteration, which incidentally in the first couple of drafts was manipulation, and I turned out that's probably not a good way to talk about this. So we're altering the network. We're tailors, you know. Um, I find this probably to be the most challenging to do. My own belief is that networks are oftentimes 
optimally formed as they are because people make friendships and attachments with others whom they have affinities with, whom they like and so on. So I think it's going to be hard to change networks. Um, not that we can't try. I think we'll learn about human behavior if we do try, but, uh, but I, I see this as a real big uh, challenge. Okay. All right. So, um, so now when it comes to implementation, right, what are we going to do if we've already got a program in place, it's ongoing, are there things that we can use network data for to understand the implementation process? And we call this, I call, we call this network diagnostics, right? And many interventions are done in group context. You bring people into a community, into a, some kind of setting. You're doing an intervention. And we want to sort of use network data to understand how that process is unfolding. So we created this table, this network diagnostics tool. And we took a whole bunch of network metrics that you're familiar with, right? And we said, well, look, we're going to set some threshold values that we want these network metrics to meet in order for us to know that a group is evolving in a way that's conducive to behavior change. So we don't want any isolates, right? We want everybody to have a degree score of at least one. We want some reciprocity, but not exclusive reciprocity. You know, we don't want to have separate components. We need some density, not too dense. Centralization, but not too centralized. Transitivity, and so on and so forth. So we came up with these values as a guide. And I'll tell you, just speeding ahead for one second, Submitted this to the journal, and I knew the reviewers were going to just crucify us on, well, where did you get these values from, right? And so, of course, you write back and go, you know, I have no effing idea. I just made it up. It's the best I can think of. And I thought for sure they were going to reject the paper. And then the reviewers were like, yeah, I can see that. Who knows? It's new, right? <laughs> so you never know with these things. And so then we made this, you know, we wrote this R program that made this really nice report. Um, you know, we took data at three weeks, collected the, um, you know, drew a network diagram, made recommendations for what you can do in order to improve the cohesiveness and the connectivity of the group. And the interventionists love this. And I was never so happy when we found out from the intervention people, they're like, this is great. I have a picture of what my group looks like, and now I know exactly what to do, right? And they're not wondering what to do, but they have a picture and specific guidelines. So that was really terrific and really, really rewarding. Um, and I'll just say we did show uh, from the three week to the six week measurement an increase in ties in the network, an increase in self-reported cohesiveness of the network. So that, you know, with a, with a sociometric, uh, psychometric scale. So that was really rewarding and really fun and, and pretty successful. So it's a nice tool which um, has yet to be used anyplace else. So let's go figure. Um, the other thing I'd like to mention, and I think a really important role for networks that is just now being developed, and that is the notion of networks as moderators and mediators of program effects. I do a fair amount of program evaluation. I teach program evaluation. And frankly, this kind of thing is happening all the time. And it makes a lot of sense, right? A tobacco prevention program is going to have a big difference in its effect if it's a person that has a lot of friends that are smokers versus one that has friends that aren't smokers. And you can think of any behavior. If you can understand the network context within which people are, are, are consuming it, then that's going to make a big difference. So for example, we find uh, low threshold adopters are more likely to be influenced by mass media programs, right? They don't have people in their network to turn to for advice or information, so they rely more on external media or formal impersonal media, if you will, um, than, than people who are, are higher threshold adopters. So this notion of using network data to understand moderation and mediation I think is really important. And there's only been a couple of papers that have come out so far, but you can imagine how rich this is um, from a theoretical and analytic uh, point of view. Okay, so network theory and analysis has been around for a long time, right? I mean, this field actually goes back uh, decades, 50, 60 years, but it's really expanding today. There's great opportunities, and I, there's a lot of young people here, which I think is fantastic because this field is wide open in terms of opportunities for contribution. We haven't, you know, we're just now testing good network models for diffusion. We've got network intervention choices that aren't being tapped, network mediation and moderation, and then all the stuff you've learned in all these workshops 
workshops or tools waiting to be had so I really encourage you to stick with it some of this stuff is complicated like all science it can be challenging to get the right data in the right setting but once you get there it's a lot of fun so um, so I hope you'll enjoy it I run the Center for Applied Network Analysis at uh, USC uh, I would be remiss without thanking all of my former students, current students, postdocs, colleagues, and friends who have been helpful getting all this done. That's one thing I'll say to anybody is make sure you have colleagues in transdisciplinary teams because this work takes a lot of help to get done. It's not the kind of thing you want to do by yourself. So with that, I'll close and thank you all very much for your attention. <laughs>
where they uh, took data on who liked whom, looked at the seating arrangements, and then purposively moved people who didn't like one another closer to one another in the classroom and showed over time that their reports of disliking decreased once they were seated closer to them. So that suggests that we can sort of accommodate ourselves to other network ties. I just see it as being more challenging to change the network rather than working from within the existing network structure. So that's my, that's my observation. I don't know how, how much uh, empirical data I have to support that, but that's just my intuition. Yeah. Yes? I'm curious on the um, diffusion of innovation side, when it, you're talking about an intervention or maybe a health message that's spreading through a network, um, and whether there's work that's done on how those, that's, those interventions are talked about, because um, you do really kind of relinquish control in some ways if you're maybe trying to spread a recommendation or uh, do you know if there's any work right. what that looks like when it hits the community? That, that, that's a, so the question is, is there any work out there where we've done an intervention, a health intervention, and then it starts to spread and people talk about it, but what happens to that message over time? Because in a way we lose control over it. And one of my central messages is always, you've got to turn control over to the community. I as an outsider can't come into a community and create change. It has to come from within. What I can do is identify the right people to be vehicles for it and give them tools to be accurate and, and persuasive in what they say. But, but I don't know of any studies that have actually tracked the diffusion of that message over time, keeping track to find out if the message has stayed true to what, what the original intention of the message was, or if it's changing and mutating over time, which you would think it might be. So that's a really good question. That's a really good study. I think it would be a little challenging because you've got to be there over a long period of time as it spreads. But if you could do that, you'd find out something interesting about the way it's changing and concomitantly is the network changing as they talk about it. Yeah. So that's a good question. I don't know. Yeah. It's an important question to think about though because it ultimately has implications for the effectiveness of our programs. Yes, Ben. IRL? Yeah. <laughs> Am I hip or what? <laughs> um, I'm curious, to what extent do you think that uh, what we're learning about social networks in real life uh, reflects in the virtual world? And also, if really we're, we're interacting in more and more different ways in the virtual world, how, uh, what are the implications? So that's a really good question. I have a couple comments about that. One is, you know, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, when a lot of this online stuff started to happen, I thought, this is going to be great for diffusion, right? Because we're always talking about how messages are diffusing over social media. And we, to my knowledge, have very few good studies of diffusion of social media. And the reason being is we've got a conflation of the network and the behavior, right? So when I retweet a message, I'm adopting that message, but I'm also creating the social network links over which that adoption is occurring. So the classic model in my mind is you have a behavior that's measured independently of the networks, and so you can trace it as it goes through. But in the social media world, that doesn't work quite like that. They're, they're kind of overlapping. So I have been racking my brain for years trying to figure out a way to either to adapt the social diffusion network diffusion model to a social media world and make it work. And, and I, really, I haven't come up with anything good on that yet, and I'm kind of frustrated by it. Secondly, a lot of our virtual communications are with people that we know in real life and communicate with. You know, so I think about my kids. They Snapchat and Instagram with people that they've known, have met, and, and spend a lot of time with face to face in addition. That doesn't mean they don't have lots of other contacts, but the ones that influence them the most are the ones that they're also close to in real life. How that's going to translate over time as these tools get you more ubiquitous and we use them more, I don't know. For old people, you know, people like my generation, we tend to communicate primarily with people that we've met, you know, and our colleagues with. We don't necessarily make new contacts online. 
So in many ways, a lot of the social media stuff that's happening is almost akin to mass media. You know, it's stuff that gets broadcast on Facebook and it's going out to thousands of people and I just happen to be one of them that's, that's, you know, that's consuming it. And it's not really creating a network linkage between me and other people. So it's a, you know, it's a kind of in-between place, but um, I think we can use our social network tools for studying social media, but we have to be pretty cautious about how we do that because it's a different set of assumptions and a different set of processes and you know I see a lot of Twitter data and a lot of it really doesn't mean very much it's a broadcast medium in my mind rather than a, a personal network one so um, so I, so I think it's useful to think about these tools and think about them in that way I am less optimistic about our ability to mine meaningful things from it than I was when it first started but that's just me then again I'm not you know I'm not consumed by social media. My kids are. Snapchat, Instagram. Yeah. All right. Thank you so awesome. Much. Thank you all.